All right, we are back in the Press Box Podcast for a new episode. Uh, this is your co-host, Joseph Miranda. Ralph will be joining me shortly. Um, in today's episode, we want to talk a little bit about um, kind of like a big picture of the main three sports, so football, basketball, baseball, um, it's more specifically NBA, NFL, MLB, and how, how they've changed, how the sports have, have changed, not only from the way it's played, but kind of the way it's uh, managed and, and, and looked at from a um, you know, coaching or front office perspective. Um, so we'll delve into that a little bit here and touch on each of those. Um, and at the end, uh, we want to talk briefly about the NFL. Um, this is not by any means our full uh, <laughs> NFL preview extravaganza podcast, but we do want to look ahead here to um, um, some of the some of the teams we think might be making some noise this year as we have a football game coming up August 1st in a Hall of Fame game. And uh, well, today is July 13th, so we're pretty close to that. So never too early to talk football. Um, so we'll have that coming right at you right after this break on the Press Box Podcast. Okay, so uh, we're back on the Press Box podcast. I'm Ralph Miranda, and uh, my co-host Joseph Miranda is along with me. And today we want to kind of talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, sports and, and all the major sports. But rather than talk about one particular topic, I think maybe today we're going to, since we're in a little bit of a lull here, you know, it's July and uh, football hasn't kicked in yet. Baseball is kind of just starting their second half. Golf is kind of winding down. Basketball, aside from all the free agent news, is really kind of over and waiting for their season to start. Hockey's in the books. So I want to talk today, or I guess we want to talk today a little bit about how our sports have changed over the last you know, 20 years, 30 years for sure, but even 15, 20 years, uh, changed not only in the way they're run, but in the way they're played. Uh, the makeup of the of the athletes themselves, and I thought that would be a good topic for us to maybe approach uh, today. So um, let's start a little bit. Let, let's start with uh, with basketball because that seems to be the the hot topic this summer with all the free agency. And um, you know, it's interesting because you know Joseph, Joseph and I were in a store today walking around, and and it was a unique little boutique shop, and and uh, and they were selling they sold socks, and the socks had teams on them you know like uh, sports teams or and, and the NBA socks had actually players on there with their jerseys on there but every NBA sock uh, had players with their former teams on them so the idea was that you know they move around so much that these socks now were all had to be marked down because sometimes they were two and three teams behind where where the player was today so so let's start with that obviously the movement of players has become a big issue, and and that was kind of started by LeBron James back in 2010 when he went to Miami. Um, but what? But let's let's. I'll throw that out to you, Joseph. I mean, that, what's your take on that? We talked a little bit about that last time, but let's delve into it a little bit deeper. How that has changed, and, and what that has done to to the league in general. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's definitely. I think we, you said it right. LeBron kind of started that whole deal when he when he left Miami, but. Um, I think a lot has to do with the contracts too. Um, I think um, what's the the max for a free agent is a four year deal right now, right? Based on um, I guess their CBA and what what they do. If you if you resign with your own team, I think you're eligible for a five year deal. But right. um, you know these four year deals. I mean, and with the sport like basketball, where your your career is longer than like an NFL career, right? Right. So you have you're up for a new contract more often, assuming you're a superstar type player. Um, at least more jumping around. Maybe that, um, maybe there needs to be the contract needs to be lengthened. You know, I think that what was it that Magic Johnson signed a twenty-five year, twenty-five million dollar contract with the Lakers at one point, right? Or so, like uh, something like that. Um, You're right. When he was a young player, um, which, and he was there his whole career, obviously. So, right. um, and I'm sure these, I'm sure some teams like, you know, a Cleveland back in the day would have liked to lock up LeBron for his entire career, like on a ten year deal, and. You know, if you're a if you're a young NBA player, say you know, 
kind of kind of like what these baseball teams are doing now with these extensions. If you're a NBA player and you've just finished your rookie deal, you know, you've obviously made a lot of money um, in terms of the general public, but for NBA, NBA money, you haven't made your your big money yet. Right. Now, I, why would you not jump at a 10-year deal to for $300 million, right? right, you know, right. That's guaranteed money to you, right? right? So maybe that's a way for these teams to keep their players going forward. But um, right now, you know, yeah, there's there's no really no incentive for guys to not move around, especially when they're talking to their friends and other teams and kind of lining up their deals. Like, like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George both signed, what was it, two-year deals with a player option so they could be free agents again at the same time, right? right? So, right. It's, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, you, know, you bring up an interesting point, but, but I, guess, I guess then, and we've, we've talked about this before, why, why don't you see that same thing in the NFL, all right? Because is it the contracts, the fact that they don't have a lot of guaranteed money? Is it the fact that the owners that, and I don't want to say collusion, but it's that the owners won't put up with it? In other words, you know, if some guy demands a trade, you know, teams are just not going to trade him. You know, I mean, uh, I mean we take the Melvin Gordon thing here from San Diego, the, or San Diego, the Los Angeles yeah. Chargers. You know, he's come out, and, and, and it's an interesting situation because he's come out and said, look, you know, I've played four years in the league, all right? Now this is my fifth year. Yeah. Because I was because I was a, a first-round pick, there's a fifth-year right. fifth yeah. option, yeah. okay? But it's a, it's a team option, right? right? Chargers okay. picked it up. All right. So the Chargers picked it up. Well, he's going to be 27 years old. All right, and and I think his option is five point six million. Yeah. Well, after that fifth year, they could franchise tag him. Okay, right. so so again, he's going to have to play another year at whatever the amount is. Right. For the, but the point is, he'll be twenty eight years old right. before he could even reach free agency, and his career might be over by right. then. Okay, so so why can't I mean, is, is it just a contract issue? Is it the fact that teams don't give in as quickly in the NFL? Uh, whereas in the NBA, these owners, you know, cave in right away. I mean, I, I don't know what the what the catch is, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that the NBA is more of a players league, right? So right. The superstars are bigger. Like uh, football, just in general, like the coaches have more power. Right. I guess you could say. Um, now you know. I mean, it's not like college where the coaches have all the power, but in general, like just just as an example, I bet you your average football fan can name more head coaches. In the NFL than the average basketball fan, probably so. Right, probably um, so. So, and also I think is unique to the NFL is this: there, there's clearly defined positions too, right? Right. So, um, you know, Kawhi Leonard can team up with Paul George, and they could bring somebody else in, and well, you know, they could both play in the backcourt sometimes. They could play the three and the four, just kind of you know whatever. Like, right. um, you know, if, if Aaron Rodgers decides he's unhappy in Green Bay, well, there's only a handful of teams you can go to because other teams have quarterbacks. Right. You can't play another position. Right. So right. I think that's part of it. Um, the contract thing you brought up is interesting because um, I can see it from a player side how that would that would not be favorable if and, and you know Melvin Gordon Melvin Gordon feels like he's outperformed his contract. He's you know probably one of the better running backs in the NFL based on you know what he's done the past couple of years. Maybe that. You know, and I like the rookie weight scale, what they're doing, mm-hmm. what they have been doing, as opposed to the Sam Bradford days where you right. you get $50 million guaranteed. But maybe, you know, maybe they go to an NBA-style deal where all rookies are on two-year deals, right? right. And and you can be franchise tag for one year only, so that's three years of control, right? right? I mean, I think most NFL teams have an idea of guys after their second year, right? I mean... Should. Uh, this, you should. I mean, like... You know, look at somebody like Patrick Mahomes. It took him one year to realize that right. he didn't play his first year, but the Chiefs are all in on him. Right. right so right. I think they'd be ready to give him a long term deal after his second year. Right. And if a guy's that's not the case, then you let him go. And, but and, yeah. And you also bring up a good point about the position thing. You know, I mean, running backs have become a devalued position in the NFL, yeah. right? I mean, you know, you can get a running back off the scrap heap. You know, yeah. you can get a running back in the third and fourth round. Look at Alvin Kamara, he was a fourth round right. pick. You know, you can you don't have to have that running back like you have to have the quarterback yeah. or the or the uh, corner or the defensive lineman or whatever it is. You know, so that's part of the problem there. But but let's move. Let's let's talk a little bit about how the game of basketball has changed as well. Just the game itself. Yeah. I mean, you know, I remember 15, 20 years ago and, and further back. You know, you had a, you had the distinctive positions, right? You had your point guard, mm-hmm. the guy who brought the ball up court. You had your shooting guard. 
you had your small forward, right, who could shoot, who was your shooting forward. Yeah. You had your power forward who could also post up and do those sort of things. And you had your true center, yeah. you know, the big guy. You don't have that anymore in the NBA. I mean, you know, you definitely don't have the true center anymore. Yeah. And I think the power forward, small forward has kind of gotten mixed as well. So it's almost like you're playing now with, you know, maybe two point guards and three forwards or, you know, a point guard, two shooting guards, right. and a couple forwards. I mean, so, and, and then the three-point line. I mean, yeah. more three-pointers have been taken, I think, in the NBA than ever before. Yeah. So it's it's kind of become a run-and-gun shoot game, hasn't it? Yeah, well, I think the three-pointer becoming popular is the issue there because, um, as you said back in the day, when you had a true center or a true big man, he'd never shot threes. Right. right. So teams are looking for quote-unquote, big guys that can shoot threes, right? right. Like a Draymond Green or like a... Um, even DeMarcus Cousins shoots threes now. Um, I think, you know, Joel Embiid's three-point three attempts are up. Um, and they're, Draymond Green is not a true big man. I think he's only 6'9". He can a little more versatile. But, um, yeah, like the, the days of a Shaq or, an, um, you know, like a Kareem, those types, those types of guys, it's coming to an end. And I think... The three the three point shot is the big thing there. That's why you're seeing these positions become blurred is because teams want guys that can shoot. And right. um those guys are all have that have a similar theme, so that's why you see those lineups look the way they do. Yeah. Um, and, and and not only the lineups, but the game too. Like, you know, you don't see the pick and roll anymore. You know, you very very rarely see the pick and roll. You know, and you you know, most of your guys now, your your guards create their own offense, you know, like Harden. Uh, so it's just it's more of a wide open game as well. It's more focused, as you said, it's a players' league. It's more focused on the player being the star, you know, as opposed to as opposed to the team being the star. And so let's let's switch a little bit. That kind of kind of moves us into baseball a little bit. We talked a little bit about this on our last episode, but I want to delve into it a little bit more. You know how the baseball the game has changed and what's caused it to change is that, you know. I remember the game of baseball, and you might remember a little bit of it, but especially especially in my days, where your managers were the type of guys like the Joe Torres, the Bobby Coxes of the world, mm -hmm. the uh, you know Walter Alston of the Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda, um, you know guys that that were that were seasoned managers, you know guys that made decisions based on you know they knew if you were hot and you should be in in that particular game or you know who their guys were they could go to. Today, most of your managers, you're seeing teams hiring guys that have been former players, but they they don't have any managerial right. experience. And part of that is because the majority of your teams, your general manager is making the decisions. He's telling the manager, this is who I want in the lineup against this guy. Okay. And and what do you attribute that to? I mean, what do you think has caused that switch? Is it the is it the onset of, of the famous movie Billy Ball back about 16, 17 Money years Ball. ago? Moneyball, excuse me, not Billy, but yeah. Billy Ball could be also the <laughs> phrase for it. But is that what did it, or or what do you attest that to? Yeah, well, I think we've talked about the three sports. Like, okay, so basketball is the players are the superstars. NFL, the coaches are the superstars. And baseball, it's like the front offices are the superstars, right? So... Um, you know, if, if you got a front office a front office team running your analytics, then yeah, it doesn't really matter matter who you hire as your manager. So you get a you get a, a former player, you know, who's maybe a fairly big name that is known the players will respect as a player, but um, you know, he's a lot of times handed the lineup card, you know what I mean? Right, so right. um yeah, I think that um as far as what caused that change, that's I mean that's a good question. Probably a lot of different factors. I mean you've got I think the money ball situation with the A's was kind of the start of it. And then you had you know, the Red Sox winning with Theo Epstein, who was kind of from, cut from that mold. Right. He goes to the Cubs and does the same thing and does that, you know, does the rebuild where they get young players, you know, if they look at, you know, their analytics to put their lineups together and who they're going to draft, who they're going to sign, that type of stuff. And, you know, just like you hear football or whatever league is a copycat league, baseball is similar in that way. So. I think that's kind of how it built from there, you know. Yeah, no, that you make a good point, and and I think, I think that part, I don't know. I, I guess it's an old school, new school type of a point of view, right? I mean, I, I think there's some there's some room for statistics. There's some room for analyzation, right? I mean, in other words, if if it's late in the ball game, you know, it's the bottom of the ninth, and there's two outs, mm -hmm. and a guy's coming up to bat uh, against a relief pitcher. 
and and you're behind by a run and there's runners on base and this guy's one for 15 against this relief pitcher, you know, maybe you make a switch, okay? Maybe because, you know, the statistics don't show. But but I think it's being used too much during the game. You know, like you bring in a certain yeah. reliever in a certain situation or you start a certain guy because his on-base percentage is this or that. And and, and I don't know, I think, I think it, that to me – that change has kind of solicited some of this home run thing. I think the balls, like we talked about last episode, are juiced because the old the the, the baseball is suffering from an identity crisis. They they're, they don't have as many young people following the game of baseball as it used to be, and the reason is because the young people aren't into this analytic stuff. So they had to bring the home run back into the game to try to get these, these young people back into it. Mm -hmm. And now you've got all these players trying to, you know, talking about launch angle and exit velocity and, and how high I can get that ball off the bat and, you know, trying, trying to adjust their swings to do that, you know, and, uh, um, you know, we were talking about strikeouts last last uh, episode, and our producer Nathan found out. You know, you made a comment that you didn't think that Tony Gwynn had struck out more than a hundred times any season, and and not he close. and you were what? It's not, he did not he wasn't close. even close. I mean, the, our producer found out that the the most strikeouts he ever had in a season was forty. Yeah, uh, it was forty two or forty six, something like but, that. Okay, so he said that Tony Gwynn played from eighty two to two thousand one. Right. And struck out, I think it was 440 times, roughly. Isn't that amazing? Aaron Judge, and he's played parts of four seasons now, but he, he just called up and hurt sometimes. So if you take, he's got about two full seasons worth of bats. He struck out 446 times. Yeah, so he struck out as many times as Tony Gwynn in two seasons, and Tony Gwynn did it 20, in 19 seasons, yeah, 20 seasons, right. right. 20, 20, 20. You know, and, and to me, that's 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 why they need the home run, you know, because, because the game has changed so much. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, and th and then again, it, it's 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 small market versus big market, which again, you have that in basketball and you have it in baseball. You don't have it in football, you know, because because of the salary cap. Yeah. And I think that's another issue. You know, I think again, we can do another show sometime about collective bargaining agreements. But I think a lot of it is, you know, what has been bargained by the players and the and the owners. You know, the NFL has bargained it properly in the sense that to to make the game become what it's become. You know, if you're a fan, for example, <clears throat> not to, not to call out the Pittsburgh Pirates or, or those type teams, but if I'm a if I'm a fan of the Pittsburgh Pirates right mm -hmm. now, all right, you know, I may go to 81 of their home games or a large percentage of their home games, but if I'm realistic, I know they really had, don't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning the World Series right now. Okay, they just don't. All right. Whereas if I'm a Yankee fan or a Dodger fan or a Red Sox fan, I go in each season with that expectation. But if I'm a football fan, okay, don't, I don't care how bad your season was last year, all right? If you draft a couple guys, you know, that are pretty good, you sign a couple free agents, football is the type of game where your team can get to the playoffs. I mean, it's been proven that it can happen. So your fans go into each season with, with a greater expectation, regardless of how poorly their team did the year before. And I think that's because of the salary cap, because of the collective bargaining, because the way they, the way they do free agency, they've made it more, more parity and more competitiveness in the game. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, you really only get that in football, right? Like, only in football. I mean, Orlando Magic fans aren't. Right, don't have title aspirations this year either. That's so, correct. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the point you said as well, and I think that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess you know, there's a lot of hype around the NFL draft picks too, right? Like if you're, take like take the Cardinals for example, they had the number one pick last year, meaning they had the worst record in the league. Right. But yeah, I don't, I'm not a Cardinals fan. I don't know how they feel, but they're probably pretty optimistic about this year, right? I mean, I, I not. I don't know. I guess they get, maybe not optimistic, but they're excited to see Kyler Murray and see right, how he does, right? Right, right. Like, um, you know, it's not inconceivable that they make a playoff run. Probably not likely, but they're, they're, I think their fans are more excited to watch them than, like you said, maybe the Pirates fans. You know, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're probably right about that. And I think the NFL is going to be facing, you know, they've got a, another collective bargaining uh, looming here. Uh, after the 2020 season, yeah. right? they'll play this season, and then they'll play next season. What, what do you think? Talking about sports changing, what do you think about the 18 games? You know, you hear that some of the owners are going to push for this this time around. Well, the owners have already thrown that out there. They that was one of their that was one of the things they wanted 10 years ago or yeah. in 2011. 
but the the Demora Smith, the uh, players' representative for the players' union, yeah. has already said that he doesn't see that being in the best interest of his players. And I agree with him. I mean, as much as I'd like to see 18 regular season games as a fan. Um, well, I mean, I think they should leave it the way it is. I think they yeah. should leave it the way it is. And, and, and for the NFL, for the owners to get it, they're going to have to give up quite a bit. Yeah. You know, and see, the players, and I think I think that's why I think there's definitely going to be a lockout this year. Mm-hmm. Or not this year, next time yeah. the bargaining thing comes up. Because the players kind of got hoodwinked 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, they wanted a certain percentage of the money. The NFL owners didn't want to give it to them. Eventually, the owners said, okay, you want this, you got to give us that. And what they ended up taking from the players was they gave Goodell unconditional control, okay? And that's why he's become judge, jury, and executioner yeah. for all these player situations, yeah. all right? The players now don't like that. They realize they made a mistake. Right. So I think you're going to see a protracted uh, 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 holdout or, lo- or lockout because the players are going to want some of that control back. The owners are going to not want to give it back unless the players give up something else, all right? right? And I think that's and I think the players are not going to give them the 18 game schedule unless the owners cave in on some other key issues for the players. Yeah, I mean, right? They would give it up for guaranteed contracts, but they're not going to. Get I, they're, that. Obviously, but they're not going to get guaranteed. Yeah. And see, that's another interesting thing to me. And I know it's all it's all bargaining and it's all you know business. But but if there's one league where a te- where players should have guaranteed contracts, it's the NFL. I mean, because. Because it's such a, you're one play away from your career being over, yeah. and and the NBA and the and Major League Baseball, you can't say that, you know, but in football, one play could end your career, well, uh, and that's why the teams don't give it, right? Because why would you if you're a, t- a GM or an owner, why would you give a guarantee contract to a guy who could be one play away from never playing for it again? Well, that's true, unless you unless you lower the length of the contracts, you know. I mean, I see why the players want it. Sure, but yeah. I also see why the owners don't want to get yeah, it. Yeah, you know, you yeah. make an excellent point. Yeah. I mean, you make it, and that's why you've got certain guaranteed money in it and yeah. deferred money and all that wonderful stuff to make it advantageous to a player, yeah. you know, in, in that in that regard. But uh, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and, and the NFL game has changed too. I mean, it's. Um, you know, look at running backs. I mean, we talked about a little bit about that, that, yeah. that the position has become devalued. Right. I mean, the Saquon Barkley, the, the fact that the Giants drafted him second overall was kind of an anomaly, and the, the Cowboys drafted Ezekiel Elliott fourth overall, but you don't see that much anymore, you know, because teams are not valuing that position right. that highly. Well, just, just look at the Le'Veon Bell situation from last year. If that... That was a situation involving Roethlisberger, right. or even Antonio Brown. They probably would have been over backwards to find a way to get him on the field. Right. Levy and Bell, they're willing to say, "Okay, you don't want to play? Fine. Right. We don't. We don't need you. Right. Um, and, yeah. We're not going to give in to you." And they found a running back that you know, wasn't heralded, wasn't a high draft pick, that had production pretty close to Levy and Bell. That's right. Know? Yeah. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, so that shows you right there how how much teams value the running back position. That's an know? excellent um, point. And we'll see how the Chargers do. We talked about. Um, uh, Melvin Gordon's situation. I mean, do the Chargers put that much value in him, or do they say go ahead and hold out and we'll find somebody else? You know, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think from the Chargers' perspective, I think they know they can find somebody yeah. else. It's just a matter of, you know, you've got a team that's got pretty good chemistry right now that was just a couple games away from the promised land. Mm-hmm. Do you break up that chemistry? You know, do, yeah. do you lose a guy that maybe could be a, your belt? bellwether guy but but again he's been injured i mean he's he was one of the guys that has missed significant time during yeah. his four years playing well, um, and the Todd Gurley situation doesn't help him at all doesn't help him at all That's he right. got he got it the, the the deal from the rams right i think what was it it was the highest paid running back in history yes it right? was yeah okay, so and he had knee issues and right. he still has knee issues he, there was i think there's some talking may have arthritis in there or whatever right. and um you know kind of disappeared in the playoffs um wasn't right in the Saints game for sure. So that doesn't help him. And the, and the Chargers can point to that and say, listen, why should we give you this one? Look what happened there. Right, right. Um, you know, so, the, I mean, they probably think they can draft a running back in the third to fifth round that can be pretty productive or combine him with another running back, you know what I mean, and get right. some production there. No, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. I think I think unless you use your running back, I mean, like a Le'Veon Bell or like the Giants use Saquon Barkley, yeah. where he, he's going to touch it and run it, you know, 20 times a game, you know, or 15 times a mm-hmm. game on each of those, then you really don't need a high price running back in the backfield because, you know, most of these teams don't run it that much. I mean, they, they throw it probably 60% of the time yeah. as opposed to running it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens this year. Um, 
as as this year plays out and the next year plays out before we get to uh, yeah. to the next contract. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you talk about throwing the the passing game of football is the same as the home run of baseball is the same as a three pointer. It's all about getting the most bang for your buck, right? Like, why should um, a guy in the NBA shoot a a two a two point shot from just a two feet in or three feet in from the three point line would you would you get an extra point right, right. and those all add up and um, same with with baseball why should you have to hit a single and a double then hope for a walk or something to get a run in where you can just hit a home run and football you know I can I can pick up twenty five yards in this play as opposed to running the ball and most likely picking up five to seven on a, on a nice play right so it's just kind of like that lack of I guess patience you want to say or yeah. like you know that these teams are um, looking at, and yeah, I mean that's no. I mean you you really bring up an extra excellent point because you know back when I was growing up in the '60s and '70s, that's kind of football was like that, like that. In other words, teams ran the ball a lot, but when they threw it, it was always deep. It mm-hmm. was always that home run yeah. type ball trying to get it over the top. Right. Then with the onset of Bill Walsh and the 49ers, right, right. you got this short passing yeah. game, you know, and that's what you see a lot of now. It's right. like, you know, let me let me use my passing game as my running game. Right. I'll pick up six yards here. I'll pick up seven well, yards there. The old saying is, what if you pass it, three things can happen, two of them are bad. That's right. Well, like you said, now teams have turned the passing game into high percentage completion. Right. You know? So, right. yeah, two bad things can happen, but it's probably not likely based on their schemes and the way the rules are now to help receiving. That's yeah. right. So you so you don't need a running back per se. Right. You know, I mean, and and like you said, with the with the rules are now, you there are certain pass routes that are always going to be open. So you can you can go to them all the time, and you can't really get to the quarterback in that amount of time. So it's uh it's become that kind of a game. Um, you still see some deep throws, you know, occasionally, but I think defenses have learned to take those away and force teams to. You know, as old Hank Stram used to say, force them to matriculate the ball down the field because yeah. the more times you go down the field, the more mistakes you can make. Right. You know, so. Um, but let's talk. I don't know if we talked in our last our last episode since we're getting close to football, and I'm sure we'll do a football preview show at some point. But but I don't think we mentioned this on the air. Let's talk a little bit about who we see the final four being in the NFL because yeah. you know it's never too early to talk NFL. And uh, last year we had the Patriots and the Chiefs on the AFC side. We had the Rams and the Saints on the NFC side, and obviously the Patriots and the Rams made it to the Super Bowl with the Patriots winning. But this year, uh, what do you see happening? Um, Give me your playoff teams first. Okay, so um, playoff teams, and this is something that, um, for me anyway, and I guess probably a lot of people, when you just think about the playoff teams on the surface, there's you know a handful of teams that come to mind that seem like the favorites or that were there last year, but there's really always two or three teams that come out of nowhere right not, maybe not nowhere but are unexpected that are new playoff teams you know so um you, you probably have to take that into consideration but so for the playoffs i'm going to go with um the rams winning the west again this year okay. um i think that um uh, as far as the nfc north um um it's I think I, that's that could be a tough one i think that you know, I, like like again, you want to say the Bears, right? right. Because they won it last year, right? and they still they're still going to have a good defense. But I don't know, would it be crazy to see the Lions get in the playoffs? No, I mean I think they could. Right. Um, uh, same with the Vikings. Um, I, you know, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and take the uh, I'll take the Lions. Let's change that. Let's do something right. different there. Right. Um, so we got Rams, Lions, South. Um, I like the Saints again. I think they're going to be strong. And then the East, I'll say the Cowboys. Okay. Um, for your division winners, and then wild card, um, I'll go with the Bears and I'll go with the Panthers. All right. So okay. NFC playoff teams there. I think the final two in the NFC for me are going is going to be the Cowboys and the Saints. Um, you know, I think the Saints are one of the better NFC teams, and the Cowboys just have kind of a feeling that mm-hmm. you know, this, it could be their year. That you know. Um, I agree. Kind of a team that. Um, they're not coming out of nowhere, but a team that maybe not a lot of people expect to get to the Final Four, but certainly are capable of it. Oh, yeah. Um, so we'll go with you the NFC before we get to the AFC. Okay. All right. Um, I, w- I agree with you on the Cowboys winning the East. I think uh, I think they're they're the team to beat this year in that division. I think in the Central Division, or Central Division, in the North <laughs> Division, uh, I got the old, the old NFL, cool, yeah. In the North Division, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with the Vikings. I think... You know they, they they had the pieces in place last year. Uh, I think there was some 
offensive coordinator issues along with their head coach, Mike Zimmer. I don't think he agreed with, with the way things were being called. Um, and, and you've got an $86 million man there in Kirk Cousins that this is kind of his make-or-break year. So I think the Vikings come back and win the, and win the North Division. I think in the South, I, I agree with you. I think, I think the Saints are too strong. I don't see anything to me except the loss of Mark Ingram. I think yeah. you know we talked a little bit about that. That could hurt them a little bit unless they can find somebody to take some of the pressure off of uh, Alvin Kamara. right? But I think the Saints do win that division. And I think in the West, uh, it's hard to pick against the Rams. Yeah. You know They've got everybody coming back. So I'll go with the Cowboys, the Vikings, the Saints, and the Rams as division winners. I think my playoff, my uh, wild card teams, I'm going to go with the Eagles uh, as a wild card team. I think they're still a pretty strong football team, even though now that they don't have Nick Foles to fall back on. And I think I'm going to go with the Seattle Seahawks as the other wild card team. As far as my final two, I agree with you. I think the Saints come through and the Cowboys come through. Okay. So moving over to the AFC. We'll start with the East, and you can pretty much put in the Patriots there. Right, man. Um, you know, Jets, Bills, and Dolphins, not really seeing it there. No, you can um, you can combine those three teams. Yeah, and they wouldn't beat this. You're right. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll go Patriots in the East. Um, the North, let's see here. I mean, look, the North, the Browns are the hot team, right? So Yeah, they're the um, favorite, right? Or that's everybody's hot yeah, favorite. Yeah, you know, I don't really see them winning no. the division, to be honest with you. No. Um, like, if they did, I guess I wouldn't be shocked because you hear so much about them. But um, I'm going to stick with uh, I'm gonna stick with the Steelers there. I don't think um, yeah, this is going to be – for the Ravens, it's going to be Lamar Jackson's first year starting from from the opening week. Mm-hmm. Um, teams have all offseason to prepare for him and what they do with him. I don't see them winning division. You know, I'd probably be around 500 or so, in my opinion. But I'm going to go with Steelers there. Um South, I'm going to go with the Colts. I think that um, a good pick. Andrew Luck's healthy this year. He was healthy last year, and they they had a good year last year. I think they're just going to build on that again this year. I don't really trust um, Mariota for the Titans. Or um, or Deshaun Watson. Right. He doesn't have anybody to protect him. Yeah, and the Jaguars, first year with Nick Foles. I'm not convinced he's a starting quarterback, right? right. He's a good backup, as we know, but you know, we'll see what happens there. So the Colts. Um, and in the West, I like the Chargers. So that's to win the division. Um, then you, I'm going to go with Chiefs as a wild card team because I think they're going to be in the playoffs. Right. Um, and other wild card. Um, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> now I'll give the Browns the six seed. Why not? Um, I you know. <laughs> um, yeah. So because you got to look at the other teams available for that. We'll call it the six seed and right. the other wild cards. You got to think the Chiefs are getting in. Broncos could theoretically get it you know, with Flacco if he has a good year. Um, that'd be three teams from the West. Um, and then you, the teams we talked about, I don't think anybody's that good from the East. And the Ravens could get it, you know, but I'm going to go with the Browns. Yeah, that's part. fair. I, I was thinking and, about that. And in the final two, um, not that I really want to, but I'm going to pick the Patriots because I, I think that's probably what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then. Uh, I'll go Patriots Colts. How about that? Okay. Yeah. All right. Patriots Colts. Right. That sounds good. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. In the East, I got to go with the Patriots. Um, that's a no-brainer there. In the North Division, um, I agree with you there. I got to go with Pittsburgh as the as the favorite to win that division. Um, I agree that I don't think the Ravens. I don't think they're division winning capable with uh, their offensive system as they have it set up. Um, they might. I mean, it's very possible, but I just think it's hard to win uh, a division. You know, the Falcons did it with Michael Vick, yeah. but they never could quite get to the Super Bowl with him. But I don't think Lamar Jackson is Michael Vick, so no. I, I don't see them winning that division. Um, in the South Division, I think I, I'm, I'm going to agree with you there on the Colts. I think they've got the best offensive line, probably the best quarterback that's proven himself coming in. And they have a pretty solid running game and a good coach. Uh, I like Frank Reich as their coach. So I think the Colts win that division. And in the West, um, you know, uh, I don't have the same level of faith in the Chargers that you do. I mean, I think they're a good team, <laughs> yeah. but I, I just can't jump on that bandwagon. I mean, it's just hard for me to do that. Um, I, I got to go with the Chiefs. I, I think I think the Chiefs win that division again. Uh Again, that's putting a lot of faith in a quarterback that's basically coming back for his second year, even though it's his third yeah. year. It's his second year as a starter. I don't know if he can get if, if they're going to win thirteen games again, but yeah. uh, but I think they're going to make. I think they're going to win the division, uh, and I think the Chargers will get a wild card. Right. I think they're good enough to do that, and I think the other wild card 
uh, is going to be, um, I like the Browns as possible wild card, yeah. but I also say don't count out the Jaguars. I mean, they've got all the pieces. I think, I think last year was a function of their offense was so bad, their quarterback play was so bad that their defense, it affected their defense. Yeah. So I think don't count them out. Yeah, they're just 18 months removed from the AFC Championship. That's game, right. You know? That's right. Uh, and if Leonard Fournette can stay healthy, which again he wasn't healthy completely last yeah. year, that helps him too. As, fi- as far as your final two, I'm going to put a caveat on that. Um, I think if the Patriots, if the Patriots have the number one seed, they will they will get to the AFC Championship game. I think if they don't, if they have to play a, a road game or have yeah. to play in the divisional series for some reason, uh, then I don't see them getting there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I know that's not being completely – that's kind of riding the fence. But, yeah, yeah. but that's – so I'm going to put a 1A and a 1B. So the right. Patriots, one of my final teams, if they if they get a, a top seed, not the Patriots if they don't. I think on the other side of it, um, I think it's probably going to uh, be – We'll save our Super Bowl picks for the – Okay, uh, no, I know. For our NFL preview. I know. Yeah. I'm just going with the other team that oh, faced the Patriots. Oh, okay, gotcha, you know? I gotcha, I gotcha. So if the Patriots don't make it, I'm going to go with the Colts and uh, and the Chiefs. And if the Patriots do make it, I'm going to go with the Patriots and the Chiefs in a rematch. Um, yeah. The Chargers, again, they're they're kind of in the same boat as the Patriots. If the Chargers win the division and get a number one seed, I think they have an excellent chance to make it because they'll be playing at home. But the Chargers, they, they can't go into New England and win. They've proven that. Yeah. It's hard for them to go, any, to go anywhere cold. So we'll see how that all plays out. I think there's a little more uncertainty there than there is in the NFC. Yeah. But uh, that's kind of my 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 thinking there. Yeah. All right. So that's 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 good for the for the for now. Excuse me for the for the NFL. We'll we'll definitely have our full NFL preview here um, coming up as the season gets closer. Yep. Um, and uh, you know we'll talk about the Super Bowl. Um, and maybe we'll talk about who we'd like to see there. Not this is who we predicted. Maybe who we right who we'd like to see we'd this. like to see. You know, it, just for the enjoyment of us. But um, we'll leave it there for now. Um, uh, so this is fun talking a little bit about how sports have changed the past few years, and of course, you know, there's many more sports to talk about. Golf changed a little bit too. Oh, sure. Ones, but we, you know, we just wanted to touch on the main the main three today, um, right. which is good. So, um, as we always say here at the end, follow us on Twitter at PressBoxPod um, on Twitter, um, and subscribe on iTunes. Um, most people listen to podcasts on iTunes, but if you don't, um, Stitcher, you can, get it, you can hear us on Stitcher, Stitcher as well. Um, and uh, if you subscribe, you'll get the um, the podcast pop up right into your inbox as one was just put up today. Um, so look for that and uh, keep listening to the Press Box podcast. Um, looking to get more guests soon, so hopefully that'll happen. Um, and uh, we put a nice little uh, streak of two two in a row here, so hopefully we can keep that going as well as we head into uh, the fall and you know a lot of stuff happening. So um, until next time, this is Joseph signing off. Ralph as well on the Press Box Podcast.